I'm interested in investing in businesses that grow. I was betting on Elon Musk, and most people bet against him. Everyone has Buffett as a role model, but he's not as growthy as I am. Ron Barron caught the investing bug as a teenager after he successfully invested $1,000 of his bar mitzvah money in a bank he had researched in his neighborhood. And it got acquired at $17 a share. So my $1,000 became $1,700. I said, man, there's nothing to this. I want to do that. Ron started on Wall Street in 1970 and spent the next decade as a securities analyst, eventually starting his investment firm in 1982 with $100,000. Barron Capital was really a barren lack of capital. Now, Ron manages over $55 billion in assets, with nearly all of it invested in public equities. I want to own stocks, shares the businesses that can outpace inflation. That's, that's my simple look. And Ron's simple strategy has been to buy and hold. He's owned shares of Charles Schwab since 1992, Choice Hotels since 1996, and Vail Resorts since 1997. It's not the time, it's the fundamentals of the business. And I could own a stock for a number of years and not make a return on it, and that wouldn't bother me. But Ron has produced returns. His super long-term strategy has made his clients $52 billion in profits. I get stopped on the street almost every day, and people come over to me and say thank you. If somebody invests in the stock market, the publicly traded stock market, which over the last 100 years probably has gone up by 6% or so a year. So if somebody invests in one of your funds, when you're publicly traded stocks, they're presumably going to do better than 6 or 7%, I guess. If they didn't, they wouldn't invest with us. Well, what do you think about index funds? Some people say just buy an index fund reflects the market. Presumably, people are buying your stock, your, your funds, because you're going to do better than the indexes. Right? Yes. And how do you, you try to outperform an index by 200 basis points, 300 basis points, or something like that? We've outperformed indexes by about 500 basis points uh, since inceptions. And so we're in the low teens, uh, mid teens. Barron Partners Fund, for example, is the number two or number three mutual fund out of, uh, since 1992, of the 22 or 2300 funds that we compare against. Barron Growth Fund is uh, in the top uh, 2% of funds since 1996. We're, we uh, very rare that mutual funds outperform their index. The index is the, is the, is the passive, and so very rare that that happens. And it's because everyone thinks that they know better and they can predict when the market's going to go up or down because they know what interest rates are going to do, they know whether we're going to go to war, they know who the president's going to be, they know what monetary policy, they know stuff. And because they know things and they're so bright, they believe that they can do better than the market. And they, and they don't because they buy and sell and every, they don't have any information that's any different than everyone else's except a different way of interpreting it, but it's very rare that they're going to be able to take advantage of that information sufficiently to be able to do better than the market. Hardly anyone outperforms. 17 or 18 funds outperform and 98.5% outperformer indexes in a very high percentage are in the top 5 or 10% of funds. Okay. So uh, we met when my own firm, Carlisle, was going public, and uh, they said, well, you need to go see Ron Barron because he buys publicly traded shares when they get public. So I met with you and I was surprised that you had a pen and you were taking detailed notes. And I said, geez, he's the head of the company. Doesn't he have somebody else doing this? But you were taking notes and I assume you wrote them up and then you assessed it and you gave us very detailed questions. You do that with all the people that are going public that you think are might be uh, interesting? Yeah, everyone who I think is interesting, that's what I do, except I don't use the pen and pencil anymore. Now I use a computer. Okay, so when you do this, um, what are you looking for? when you're you, are known for having a long-term hold position. You buy stocks, you told me this when we were getting ready to go public, if you bought our stock, which you did, you hold on for a long time, which you have. Why do, what is your theory about holding on for a long time? Why not just sell and take a profit? Well, first of all, you promised me I was going to make money. That was a promise. Okay. And so you said, you can buy my stock. Wall Street is not understanding the value of this business. And the stock was 22 at the time when you went public. Right. And now it's 49 and right. 49.16 or something. Oh. And if you compounded, including the dividends, we would have made 16.1% investing with you from the time you went public. And so why didn't we buy and sell? Because if you buy and sell, you t pay taxes every time you do that, number one. Number two, what makes me okay. think I'm so smart that I'm going to be able to figure out the exact top and the exact bottom, buy here, sell there. And so that didn't make sense. And plus, I didn't have any confidence that anyone was going to be able to predict 
uh, what the stock market was going to do. I got the confidence from watching Greenspan say about irrational exuberance in 1996, saying that you know, the market was too high, then the market went up 80% the next three years. So for any SEC commissioner who's watching, I didn't promise the stock would go up. I said I was hopeful that it would go up, or whatever I legally was able to say, just for the record. Okay. It was, you were definitely within the framework okay. of what's legal. Good. Okay. So let's suppose uh, you see somebody come to your office. They're going to go public. They want to meet you because you're known to be a long-term investor. And you kind of say, geez, maybe these people aren't as good as I thought. How do you, what do you look for when you're looking at a CEO who's coming in to pitch you on his IPO or her IPO? So about the person, we're looking for an individual who we trust, we think would be a good leader, is a good leader, smart, hardworking, not going to take advantage of us. Uh, and uh, the businesses in which we're investing, we think are competitively advantaged. There's something about those businesses that makes it very difficult for someone else to compete against them. So it's hard, it's competitively advantaged, great people, uh, and uh, there's big growth opportunities. That's what makes us invest. Generally, um, when you buy a stock, you intend to hold on to it. But if you're not happy, do you hold on for a year, or two years, three years? What is the average time it takes for you to say, I made a mistake and I'm gonna get out? It's not the time. It's the fundamentals of the business. And I could own a stock for a number of years and not make a return on it, and that wouldn't bother me as far as making me think I had made a mistake. We were an investor in Tesla for four or five or six years and didn't make a return. Uh, and then all of a sudden we made seven times in, in a year. So it's not the time that does it, it's the fundamentals. We made $4 billion in profit in so far, and I think we're gonna make another triple, uh, maybe four times over the next 10 years. market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. Who will be the world's first trillionaire? Money manager Ron Barron thinks it could be Elon Musk. And Barron is putting his money where his mouth is. More importantly, he's putting his clients money too. In his Barron Partners Fund, Barron has 38% invested in Musk's electric car maker, Tesla. And investors saw an almost 150% return on their money last year. The Barron Focus Growth Fund returned 122% in 2020. It has almost a third of its assets invested in Tesla. Still, that only begins to tell the story of just how good a bet Tesla has been for Barron. Between 2014 and 2016, Barron bought $387 million worth of Tesla stock at a split-adjusted price of $43 a share. The stock's closing price as of September 7, almost $753. If anything, though, Barron is even more bullish on Musk's privately held rocket company, SpaceX. He's put several hundred million dollars into SpaceX so far. Barron's counting on the company eventually taking off like a rocket predicting a return on investment of up to 50 times in the next 10 years. As for Musk becoming a trillionaire, the Bloomberg Billionaires Index has him at slightly more than $200 billion. But Barron's forecasts have been pretty good so far. Ron, you are a big believer in Tesla and a big believer in SpaceX. Before everybody else went along with that route, that they were great companies, what did you see in Tesla early on and what do you see in SpaceX now? Uh, in Tesla early on, I thought the opportunity was to convert the cars that we make in the United States and the world uh, from gasoline uh, to electric. And that hadn't been accomplished ever before, and I was betting on Elon Musk. And uh, uh, so far, and most people bet against them. Uh, we invested uh, you know, $380 million uh, in between 2014 and 2016 after thinking that we shouldn't invest in it and was 1.5% of our assets at the time. And uh, we made $4 billion in profit in so far, and I think we're going to make another triple, uh, maybe four times over the next 10 years. What about SpaceX? Is SpaceX the same as Tesla? Uh, it's the same idea where you're disrupting an industry that is a cost-plus industry. So all of the aerospace companies uh, don't do research, and they didn't want to innovate. And the reason they didn't is because they had a business that was producing rockets, and they felt if they could use a rocket over and over again, uh, they, why would they make, uh, you know, they wouldn't be a demand for fewer rockets. And so as a result of that, uh, there was no innovation, and uh, they, what they would do is they would subcontract out 
the work that they did on these rockets so they would become more and more and more expensive. Uh, and the government would just pay it. So Elon comes along and he says, I got a cheap way to get to space. And the cheap way is by using the rockets over and over and over again. And everyone else said that was impossible to accomplish. Uh, and as a result of that, um, no one did it. And our man did. And this is a real big cash flowing business. He expects to have 40,000 satellites. So he's cheap satellites. Everyone else was uh, send up satellites and be very, very expensive. When you, you can use the rocket over and over again, uh, then it's inexpensive to get it. Uh, your launch is inexpensive, and that gives you a chance to put up a lot of satellites and uh, 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 you know, serve need for humanity. All right, but let's, let me ask you about this. You have one person who's the CEO of both companies. Yes. Um, doesn't it make you nervous that one person is driving both companies? Is normally you wouldn't invest in somebody who is running two companies at the same time, would you? We have one person running two companies, one person who is... Uh, you know, working, uh, you know, ungodly hours, uh, totally dedicated, doesn't need very much sleep. I was speaking to a director of SpaceX uh, two nights ago. And uh, so I was saying, how's Elon doing? And he says, he's doing unbelievably. He lives in this small cottage, two bedrooms uh, on this desert property, you know. <laughs> and I said, is there air conditioning? He said, yes, there's air conditioning. But he's from, uh, you know, from uh, South Africa. So he doesn't need as much, but uh, but he is uh, in his air conditioning, and, uh, and he works all but five hours a day, and he works continuously, totally dead. He's like you. So you f spend your time on airplanes. He spends his time okay. in factories and uh, pr producing these things. Do you have a Tesla? Yes, three of them, four of them. And when you drive them and you say maybe something could be better, do you call up uh, Elon and say, can you fix this? Actually, we do, and uh, uh, when we bought the first one, my wife was complaining about the makeup mirror, and she says, there's no makeup mirror here. I said, how can there not be a makeup mirror? So I call them up and I say, we had just been to visit their engineering plant where the, the guy who comes up with the design for the cars. And I said, well, my wife is complaining about this car that there's no makeup mirror. He says, yeah, we've had to do a special, where well, they put in that, that actual mirror. So that was my wife's idea. They don't call it the barren makeup? <laughs> no. Um, right now, many people think the stock market's pretty high fairly valued, very fully valued, many people would say. So are you nervous about that? I don't worry about it. Uh, and in 2019, December 99 through 2008, uh, were really difficult eight or nine years for the stock market. The stock market was down 30 or 40 percent, three or four percent a year for eight or nine years. We didn't make a lot of money in that period of time, but we didn't lose. We were up 25 percent over that eight or nine year period of time, which was really terrible for the market. And, uh, and then since then, of course, we've done very well. And what I think is that, so my big picture of the world, the only thing I am certain of, is, I'm sure about our economy, I'm sure about our country, uh, but I think that the value of my money will fall in half every 17 or 18 years. That means that everything I want to buy is going to double in price every 17 or 18 years. So I regard stocks as a hedge against that depreciation of my currency. So I want to own stocks, shares the businesses that can outpace inflation. So that's, that's my simple look. And I, I think that no one can predict what the market's going to do. No one can predict when it's too high or too low. And I'm just taking the, uh, you know, what's coming at us. And when we get opportunities, when the market falls, for example, periodically, like right now, there's been this rotation out of the kind of companies that we've invested in that have done so great for the past couple of years into something that is cheaper. Like, for example, we had an investment in Dick's Sporting Goods. Love this guy at Stack. We invested with him for maybe eight or 10 years. And then about, I don't know, maybe our cost was $10 a share. And, and uh, about uh, three or four years ago, we sold our stock at around 40 or $50 a share. And because I was convinced, or I thought that I didn't want to invest so much in retail anymore. And even though I thought he was a terrific retailer, I wanted to invest in something different. And uh, so we sold. Uh, yesterday, they reported earnings for a quarter of $5 a share for the quarter and compared to two and a half dollars that people had expected, and the stock went up 15 or 17 points to $117 a share. And so I sold at 50, so, and, 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 and they're paying a $5 special dividend. And so, so I don't switch uh, to be fashionable to okay. say, but that's what's outperforming. So this year we're up in the low to mid-teens 
on average for our firm. Uh, our clients, a couple of our mutual funds are up in the 20s. Uh, and a couple of them are up in single digits. Uh, so we're up, but, but if I had switched around, if I had been so deft and agile that I could sell everything that I had that I thought was you know, a little expensive at the time and buy some things that looked incredibly cheap because they were uh, depressed by the economy, cyclically, uh, and then switched out and then switched back, I would have made more money, would have paid a lot of taxes, but it would have made more money, but I don't do that. So let me ask you, uh, some people say that because of inflation or other things worry about the currency, you worry about the currency going down in value every 50% every 17 years or so, something like that. Yes. What do you think about cryptocurrencies? Chris, that, that's, a, that's a commodity. And so I don't invest in commodities. I don't want to, I don't own gold. I don't own okay. uh, a cryptocurrency. So you're not an investor in cryptocurrencies. No, and I always worry if you have cryptocurrencies and they get to be real valuable, now why is the government going to allow some private uh, enterprises to have control of their currency and their economy? Okay. And then in, in 1932 or 33, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, people were afraid of the, leaving their money in the banks. They took the money out of the banks and they bought gold. Then he made it illegal to own gold. You had to turn in all your gold. Why do I think that that same thing couldn't happen? I'm not saying it will, but, but you know, I would think there's some risk as well. I tell the young people who work with me what they should be thinking about is if everything, the well-being of their families was dependent upon them being right on the business in which we're investing on their recommendation, what would they need to know to be able to make that recommendation to us. When you have that much money, $55 billion under management, you've got a lot of responsibility. Uh, every night, do you worry that your stock market is going to go down and your assets will go down and people are going to call you up and their people call you to complain or they basically say, I'm happy? Um, they say they're happy. And they say they're so happy that, uh, that I get stopped on the street uh, all the time. My picture's in a quarterly letter. I get stopped on the street almost every day, and people come over to me and say thank you. Uh, last night, we were at a dinner at a restaurant, and uh, as we were walking out, a man walked over to me and said, thank you very much. You paid for my daughter to go to college. After all the years that you've been doing this, what have you learned about what investors most want and how to deal with investors? I think that uh, most people want uh, to have their money grow consistently uh, every day and, uh, and make high returns without volatility and low fees. That's what they want. That's not what they can get, by the way. <laughs> so you're very famous having a conference in uh, your annual shareholder meeting, I guess, in New York, and you have a lot of People famous call, people there. People call it my annual bar mitzvah. Annual bar mitzvah. And you've had very famous people. I don't know if you're allowed to say who they were, but they're great yeah. entertainers. McCartney, Barbra Streisand, Billy Joel, Elton John, Jerry Seinfeld. We have a lot of entertainers, and I pay for that. That's not the, uh, that's the, the investors, if they have at least $25,000 invested, they can come to that meeting. So is it easier to negotiate with the CEO or Paul McCartney or Barbara Streisand? Man, you can't believe what it's like to negotiate with some of these performers. The crazy thing, the, well, I shouldn't say crazy. They're very reasonable things that they ask for. <laughs> so if somebody wants to invest with you, I'm not advertising for you, but if somebody wants to invest, how much do they have to invest to be in one of your funds? The normal is $2,000, uh, but you can invest for as little as $500 and $50 a month. Uh, no, no fees to buy or sell. But if you sell within three months of the time you purchase, you can sell the next day. But if you sell within three months, then we regard you as a trader, T-R-A-D-E-R, and you're not going to be allowed to buy with us anymore. It sounds like a T-R-A-I-T-O-R. Right. Yeah, I think of it that way. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So um, generally, when people who are very successful, as you are in the financial service world, uh, when they um, want to build an institution, they often get people from outside their family to come in and help them. You have two sons who are in your business, and like a lot of family-owned businesses, the sons are going to continue on or the daughters will continue on. So is that what you'd like your sons to continue the business? I sure hope so. And I've been brainwashing them since they're four years old. <laughs> okay. And so you can tend to do this for as long as you can do it, right? You're not slowing down. You're not going to go play golf full time. As long as I'm healthy. You get a charge out of investing. What is it that you like about investing? I love what I do. Uh, when I get to meet and talk with people who run businesses who are changing the world and explain to me how they're doing it, it is so much fun. 
I have, my wife says, how could you spend so much time? All of my friends, she says, all my friends, their husbands don't work anymore. How come you work? But it just takes a lot of building to get to this point. You just don't say, okay, I'm gonna do that. My job is different. I'm trying to build an institution that's gonna last for 100 years. So have you had role models as great investors over the years? Oh, well, everyone has Buffett as a role model. But he's not as growthy as I am, but I, I like reading his letters. And he writes these letters. You write your letters as well? Yeah. In fact, uh, one of my friends uh, is Chuck Matheson, and he was a chairman of International Game. They're a slot machine manufacturer. He is best friends, or was, with Warren Buffett. And uh, they play bridge together on the internet. And then uh, one time I wrote something nice about Chuck in one of my letters, and Chuck said, Buffett just called him to congratulate him on my mention of him in my letter. So Buffett was actually reading my letters. For young students who say, I want to be the next Ron Barron, if not Warren Buffett, um, what do you recommend they do to prepare to be a good investor? Um, I think, first of all, I think they should study the businesses in which they're investing or which they want to invest and why they're going to invest in them and understand uh, the economy. There's changes. Change is what's happening everywhere. You know, all the growth in the world has taken place in the last 200 years, and the growth is now accelerating. So you have to understand what's happening in the world around you, what's happening in our country. You know, not that you're going to make decisions on, on a short-term uh, basis, but uh, I tell the young people who work with me what they should be thinking about is if everything, the well-being of their families was dependent upon them being right on the business in which we're investing on their recommendation, what would they need to know to be able to make that recommendation to us? If everything you have is dependent on you being right, that doesn't mean you have to be right all the time, but if everything you, you, you have to, you know, for your well-being of your family, what do you have to know? That's the questions that you need to ask, okay. not about the next quarter. So what is the most common uh, investment mistake that you think people make? Uh, well, they, they think they can open up an account at a brokerage firm, uh, then uh, they can buy and sell stocks and do as well as anyone else. They can trade. And I think that's a fallacy. I think that, uh, you know, just like I wouldn't want to fly an airplane or be a dentist or even cut my hair with what I have left of it, uh, that uh, I, I think that people have, uh, you know, an understanding that they can buy and sell stocks just because they can pick up a phone and, and do it and they can't. Okay, and um, if you were to advise somebody today about uh, the opportunities to invest, generally you would say public equities are, are good places to invest? For long term, but just invest the same uh, every year. So don't think about it as this is an investment I'm gonna make. You should think about uh, for the security of my family and myself, I should invest. Is there something you would tell somebody not to invest in? Is there something you'd say, please don't invest in area A or area B or commodity A or commodity B? Is there something you think is a big mistake to invest in? It sounds like crypto is one of them. Well, I'm not investing in crypto, but that doesn't mean it's not a good idea. I mean, there's really smart people who have big investments in crypto. Uh, I study it and periodically, and, and I choose not to because it's a commodity. And um, so I'm not interested in investing in commodities. I'm interested in investing in businesses that grow. Businesses that grow, great people, competitively advantaged, and for the long term. And most people think that uh, because you can they get a check in the mail and they can take that money and open up an account and buy and sell stocks, and it's like gambling. I don't regard investing as gambling. I regard it as trying to take care of you and your family for the long term, and you do it by investing similar amounts for a long time uh, and, and, and living to be old and then you get to be rich.